Uh, today we do some video taping of the session. There's Tom over there, and I so I brought my own paparazzi if you want some. And I say what I always say because I can't get permission from all of you. There are too many of you. So, gentlemen, if you have told your wife that you're here with a colleague, <laughs> you consider leave the room now. <laughs> and I also have to tell you, uh, I had a stroke and obviously my both course affect this well. That's why it's difficult for me to talk and to understand for you, of course. So you have to tune in and probably concentrate a bit more on what I'm saying. Now, four stages of rehabilitation, everything I tell you is either from my own experience or I also work as a counselor, so it's uh, from other people. Not only people with a stroke, but in general, a life-changing experience. So that could be accident, heart attacks, whatever, you know. So and most people stick only of uh, the first the physical stages. And I will uh, tell you how you can actually, what you can do to assist people to complete the cycle of rehabilitation. So the first stage is the metrical stage, purely in the hand of the doctors. Now I will use my own stroke to demonstrate that. So there I was, I had a stroke, a cerebral um, vessel accident, and November to 1990, and it was a brain stem stroke, so pretty bad. I shut down, the body shut down totally, and I had a tracheostomy. They put me into an induced coma. I was 10 days in the coma. Intensive care, first the critical care, then in intensive here and there, I was still locked in. So nothing at all functioned. So the second stage after that is the physical stage. They actually started the physical therapy on me. So I was taken to a private room and I was in bed there and they started there was a chair, they got me out of bed and put me in the chair, strapped me in and let me sit there for an hour because the body was still quite wobbly and I would have slipped out. And from there I came to an eight bed ward and because I was lying so long, I had a DPT and then another one and I had two pulmonary embolisms and the one was wrongly diagnosed as pneumonia and uh, so they performed the angiogram and they saw that it was in fact a pulmonary embolism and they considered the risk of the stroke to be too big so they inserted a in the state they call it the great filter. Here they call it a burst nest filter. I still got that in the vena cava here. And um, basically to stop blood clots from going up to the brain or the heart or the lungs. And after four and a half months I was released from hospital. And that's where the psychological stage and that's where for most people the proverbial hits the pan. Mm -hmm. Because that's when they are on their own the first time and they have a lot of thinking to do and there are a lot of things they have to deal with. 
change our lifestyle, for example. I mean, that includes everything. There's financial, uh, less income, one less income. The relationship changes, interpersonal relationships. I heard often from either wives or children that yeah, children said, my daddy is not in there anymore. So that's a pretty big thing for a little child to say that, you know. The other thing that was uh, came up in counseling sessions, and that was totally unprompted, but people said mortality, they use that word mortality, and I found it quite interesting because we don't normally talk about our own days and most of these people said, oh, it was the first time in my life that I actually had to think about that could have been it. You know, I came so close that whether it was a stroke or an accident or whatever, but many people thought after that that they could have died in the accident and they had to be at home uh, dealing with it on their own. So now we come, they have to grieve, complete the grief process. People have to go through the grief process. And I have made that very like a dartboard because it's not actually a list. It's people can, uh, obviously individuals are different and they have, they either, they react to it in a different way. So people are either in denial at first, or they are angry or they slip into a really bad depression. Another thing they don't like to talk about normally, people don't like to admit they are depressed. No. Some studies say it's about 70% of all people who've had a stroke are depressed. Others say, oh, you can easily double it. Said percent is pure fantasy. Huh? The most important thing on there is obviously people have to accept it, but then the most important thing, and that's where you can help patients, is the stop taking. Now, that will initially be very negative. They will only think of the things they can't do anymore. So it's part of your job to tell me that there are still plenty of things they can do it. It's just what they have to do. You see there in the bullseye, adopt and adapt. So they have to adopt the condition, the disability, own it, and then adapt, finding way around of doing things in our way that suits them not anyone else, just them. They might not always look good, but they get there eventually. Now, the last one is the social stage. And that's all about the comfort zone. So, when we are in hospital, our comfort zone is basically reduced to the size of our bed. And so our real comfort zone is taken away from us. And we let people in, like the family, doctors, nurses. And so there, 80 to 90 percent of all people live their life in the comfort zone. All they want basically is a better life for their children, a house, a picket fence, two and a half children, and a dog. And, but they don't venture out there. They are not entrepreneurial because that would mean that they take a risk. But of course, with every risk, if it works out, 
they come to the rewards, so they achieve things. But people, as they come at Sondorban, then they come out of hospital and they make their home, they come at Sondorban. They are still not going out there. Because beyond the comfort zone, then there's the panic zone, and we don't want to panic. We don't go there normally. So many people don't actually go. They still sit at home and stay at the wall, have no social contact whatsoever. So then I, at the end, I like to show you the four stages again, so the medical that would be totally the end of the stomach. Of course, that can sometimes go on. They are not clearly defined as four stages because the doctor might well uh, control hypertension or warfarin or what for a longer time than the four stages. But normally we have the physical thing, like physical therapy, and most people, if you go out there today and ask someone from the public, they only think about those physical things. For them, uh, rehabilitation is all physical, nothing else. And this is why it's important for you uh, to help and prepare patients to make the transition to the psychological state and the social state. Actually going out there, press the flesh, meeting people. And lastly, I want to say that after socialization, there are still obstacles in the way, and maybe you can help me to get rid of obstacles like this. <laughs> Thank you.